this video was originally recorded April 2020. To learn more about the Bob Thurman podcast, please visit his website at bobthurman.com. Recording and uh, and you can get started. Hello, everybody. We are here on the Bob Thurman podcast, and um, which I think I might rename "Buddhas Have More Fun" podcast. I like that. I might, <laughs> I might but uh, depending on whether my publisher lets me keep that working title or not, it's a. I know it's a hard title at the moment. We're all suffering the COVID virus freakout, but. Um, but uh, that's what I might call it. The moment is the Bob Thurman podcast. And I am so honored and pleased and delighted to have Dr. Mark Hyman here with me, who I'm a complete fan of his work. And um, I, when I read, I've known him for some time, but we're all so busy, you know, in life. And we don't get to see our good friends we have natural affinities with so often. And... Um, but when I read his, and I've used even his books, The Metabolic and this and that, and Where's Mark Hyman and all this, you know, because we, I, I have a uh, healing center based on com complementary medicines and new medicine. And actually, your dear friend, the functional medicine guy, Frank Lippman, yes. was, was instrumental in helping us get the Menla 350 acres and so on, you know, and um, uh, 325 acres. And uh, so, you know, it has a history anyway. And, uh, but, and, but then when I read the food fix thing, it just so blew my mind because, you know, I'm going to introduce him in the normal way, but then I'm going to say one more thing. So Dr. Mark Hyman is a practicing family physician. That also freaked me out. <laughs> All the physicians are some sort of specialist. <laughs> and you're a family physician. Yeah, and in yeah. our medical system, we have to bring from Pakistan or India or Thailand some family practitioner. And yet you are that. That's what the major thing is, to take care of families. I think it tests me. <laughs> I'm an internationally recognized leader, speaker, educator, and advocate in the field of functional medicine. He is the founder and director of the Ultra Wellness Center, the head of strategy and innovation of the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine, a 13-time New York Times, 13th time, wow, <laughs> best-selling author and board president for clinical affairs for the Institute for Functional Medicine. How wonderful. He's the host of one of the leading health podcasts, The Doctor's Pharmacy, on which I just appeared, to my delight. Dr. Hyman is a regular medical contributor to several TV shows and networks, including CBS This Morning, Today, Good Morning America, The View, and CNN. He is also an advisor and guest co-host on the Dr. Oz Show. Yeah, Dr. Oz. Mehmet was there with the Dalai Lama, too. Yes, you know? I was there and at that meeting. I, I got to go on his show. I got to get after Mehmet. Anyway... Um, what I, what I am so excited about, although now that I've rediscovered Mark more in detail, there's many more things I'm excited about, but I am so totally excited about his food fix because doctors, you know, normally they deal with their patients and they try to do the best they can. And then sometimes some patient has in family abuse, et cetera, they'll maybe try to help them in their setting, you know, in the mm -hmm. household, in the household. They will, you know, if it's some sort of, if that connects to their symptoms and the cause of their thing. And the functional people are particularly good in going deep causation. But if you go to deeper causation, it's the whole food system. It's the whole agricultural, the business system, the whole culture, materialist culture actually is making so many people sick with all these chronic illnesses. And he, this book totally gets it. And I just couldn't believe that because, you know, I'm retired, uh, as you all know, I think from previous podcasts, I'm retired. I'm an emeritus professor at my dear old Columbia. And uh, uh, I've become a climate reality project uh, leader, supposedly. And, um, and I do my best, you know, to do that, give talks and things. And, um, and uh, I'm really into Greta Thunberg, and I'm a great-grandfather, I have a great-grandchild, and I don't want to turn the planet over in this mess to yeah. those people. 
<clears throat> so I, I, I'm so thrilled to have uh, Mark, Dr. Mark, here on the thing. And, I, and so I have some questions for you. <laughs> so nice to have you here, really. Oh, great. it's so great to be here with you, Professor. Oh, uh, good. So anyway, how did you get into Food Fix? How did you do it? I have had many MD acquaintances who do good work the best they can. But when I bugged them, which I did before I was doing climate reality, <laughs> I did that as a professor, the tracking the source of diseases they have to deal with back into the soil of the earth. Cancer is in the soil. Cancer mm. is in the Monsanto mm. chemicals. Cancer is in the, the messing with the, by the GMO, you know, uh, HMO, you know, the politics of the country, et cetera, is beyond their scope, they say. Well, of course, they're all very stressed out, dealing with so many six people. There's not enough doctors. We only have 2.4 per, what is it, thousand. And in South Korea, uh, in South Korea, they have eight per thousand. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh no, Cuba, they have eight. South Korea, they have six or something, you know. And, uh, but anyway, we have other good things, but we need more and et cetera. Anyway, so they don't will give this kind of weight to the food system as part of the disease causes, mm -hmm. as you do. <clears throat> so your mm -hmm. book, an agriculture, farming system. So your book really opened my eyes and I hope it opens everyone's eyes. So are you concerned? So that's, that's my first question. Yeah. So how, did, how did you get into this? How did this? I get into this? Well, yeah. you know, you have yeah, some I'll small part in that. I think, you know, uh, I, I, I uh, for those of you don't, listening don't know much about me, I uh, went to college and studied Buddhism after I heard Professor Thurman give a talk at Amherst in 1975. And it sort of set me on this path of understanding the nature of reality. And 1975? Yes, that was the day, my 1975. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, okay. I was 15 years old and it just, it blew my mind. And it, it, it led me on the path of inquiry about the nature of reality, the nature of the cause of things and how things yes. work and, and the yes. interconnectedness of things and how yes. we are all one system. And it sort of reminds me of that joke that uh, this is, Ita I think it was an Italian news uh, reporter had the Dalai Lama on, a, on an interview and he said, you know, he was trying to joke with the Dalai Lama. He didn't quite get it. He's like, so what is the Dalai Lama's favorite pizza? And it was one with everything. And the Dalai Lama was like, one with everything? I don't know what you mean. <laughs> but I think, and I, I think the idea that everything is connected has been you know, a central uh, frame of how I've seen the world yes. from very early on. Uh, yes. And I read, I read a book um, way before I even thought about medicine. I was studying Buddhism. I studied biological agriculture at the Goddard College, uh, there was the Institute for Social Ecology with Murray Bookchin, who was an anarchist at the time, a crazy yeah. guy, who was studying, you know, all these different things. And this book I read called Soil and Health, uh, and Sir Albert Howard was the father of organic agriculture, and he said the whole problem of health in soil, plant, animal, and human is one great subject. So you can't uh -huh. tease these apart. They're one interconnected subject. And so as a doctor, uh -huh. you know, I've been sitting in my office for 30 years seeing patients with chronic illness and diabetes and heart disease and Alzheimer's and cancer and autoimmune diseases and allergic diseases and digestive problems and all these issues. Yeah. And when it's really through the lens of functional medicine, which is a systems view of disease, it's, it's about a root cause analysis of yeah. the cause of disease and also yeah. the the ways in which we can create health. It's really a yes. very akin to Buddhism. I, I began to ask the question, well, why are my patients sick? And it turned out most of them, to some degree or another, and often most of the reason was food. And it was uh -huh. really bad food. It was the yes. processed industrial diet that we're eating, which mm -hmm. we now know kills uh, conservatively 11 million people a year. I think far more than that, actually. Oh. This is a global burden of disease study that was published a few years ago, showing in 195 countries, and they looked at diets, lack of protective foods, which is whole real food, yeah. and too much of these yeah. ultra-processed foods yeah. kills 11 million people a year, which is more than oh. anything else on the planet, more than smoking, more than accidents, more whatever. It's the number one cause of death and disease and suffering. And so I began to say, well, if the food is causing my patients to be sick, what's causing the food? So I began yes. to go down that rabbit hole. Well, it's the food system 
Yeah. Uh, and then I'm like, well, what's causing the food system? Well, it's our food policies. And then what's causing the food policies? It's the food industry's influence on our government and controlling those policies that don't serve public health, but right. actually right. serve private profit. And right, so I right, began right. to really think as a doctor, I cannot treat my patients in my office. I can't cure diabetes in my office. I can't cure heart right. disease in my office. It's cured right. on the farm, at the yes. sea level, yes. at the farm, in the soil. It's cured in the grocery store, in the kitchen, in the restaurants. That's where it's cured. And you know, the silver lining, and we're now in the midst of this COVID pandemic, uh, is, yeah. is uh, yeah. that nobody's eating at fast food restaurants <laughs> anymore. Yes. And that people are having to actually cook at home and reclaim their kitchens. Yeah. And yeah. I hope they do it in a way that actually makes them healthy. And I, and I, so I began to really think about going down this rabbit hole and exploring the interconnections. And I realized that everything's connected to our food system and yes. some more than others, but most of our global problems and crises are connected to the way we grow food, yes. how we process it, how we market yes. it, distribute it, yes. sell it, eat it, waste it. All these are one problem. And, and yes. when you look at what they do, one, yeah, it causes the majority of death and disease on the planet. There's about 70 yes. million people that die every year around the world and probably 50 million of those deaths are contributed to uh, our food system. It, yes, it, it drives absolutely. the economic problems resulting. Yes. So the, the, I mean, we're talking about the economic slowdown here from COVID, but the, the burden over the long haul on economies and governments from chronic disease is staggering. Right. One, take this, this one fact, one out of two federal dollars, which is from our yes. tax revenue by yes. 2025, which is very shortly to come, yes. is going yes. to be needed to pay for Medicare and most of that, 80 plus percent of that is for chronic disease that's preventable or treatable with food. Yes. It's a staggering yes. amount of money. Uh, I know. And, and, then you, and then you've got the other consequences to uh, social issues. For example, children. Yes. You know, children yes. are unable to learn and focus uh, and mm. do well per, in, in school. There's a whole concept called the achievement gap where kids eating yes. junk food can't focus and learn and they have behavior issues and violence and all sorts of problems. So we're yes, threatening yes, yes. our future generation. Yes. Uh, then it, then it, it affects these poor communities that are targeted more. So they end up in this vicious cycle of, of food injustice with food swamps and food deserts and yes. lack of access. And, and the most um, uh, vulnerable among us, the most underserved among us are the most obese and the most sick and the most likely to die from chronic terror, disease. Terror, it's like the terror. third world. The life expectancy can be 20 years difference between a, uh, a zip code with low socioeconomic status versus a more affluent zip code. That's right here in America. Uh, and so you've got that. Uh -huh. and, then, and, then, and then you've got, and then you've got um, the, the consequences on mental health. We know there's just massive anxiety, depression, and mental health issues. And it turns out there's a whole field of nutritional psychiatry look, link, looking at the link between what we eat and our mood and our oh really and oh, our good. behavior oh absolutely so there are people in the psychiatry onto that oh that's great. yes there there is now an increasing awareness that food plays a role in mental health uh, and we we often miss miss um, you know misconstrue emotional uh, yes. disturbances that yes. are really resulting from physical causes. So there are real emotional yes. things that happen to us, but there are also physical causes of, of mental health. Absolutely. Uh, and in, in prisons, they have uh, violent oh. crime go down by over 50% simply by swapping out healthy food for the junk food in prisons. <laughs> and we think, wow, violent criminals, maybe some of their behavior is caused by what they're eating. Of course. So you've of got course. all these issues. And then, and then the bigger issues are the environment and climate issues. So, yes. so I think most of us are not aware that our food system, end to end, right, from yes. the soil yes. to deforestation to yes. to the food waste to transport, yes. refrigeration, processing, yes. factory farming of animals, as a whole, end to end, is responsible Flowering. for, for the number one cause of climate change. Yes, thirty to forty percent of all the carbon in the atmosphere today, which is a trillion tons is from the destruction of our soil and soil erosion. And why? Because yes. in the soil, in really rich soil, is carbon. And how did yes. that happen? Well, the plants breathe carbon. They breathe carbon yes. dioxide. 
<laughs> which produce then something called carbohydrates because it's carbon yes. carbohydrates <laughs> that go into the soil That's and right. in the plant roots and enrich the soil and provide yes. the food for the microbes. And yes. it's this beautiful ecological cycle. When we till the soil and use chemicals in the soil, we literally kill the soil. It's like antibiotics for our gut microbiome. And that That's leads to terrible. the destruction of soil, which yes. is driving up to 30 to 40% of the carbon in the environment. So it's also a carbon sink and it can solve it. And then you've right, got the right. environmental consequences around right. Around right. the pesticides, herbicides, right. fertilizers, I could go on and on. So you've got this entire <laughs> ecosystem that's all connected from yes. the destruction of species and biodiversity and pollinators to the destruction of humans, to the threats to our kids, to the threats to yes. our social uh, social fabric. So you, you, you've got one problem that's seen as all these siloed issues. And I felt yes. like I needed to tell the story of how this is all connected and oh. expand the framework of my patient from being the person sitting in front of me to being the entire ecosystem of our that's food right. system and everything that's, that's right. connected. So that's, that's the sort of short awesome. story. <laughs> that is awesome, really. Makes me think of a, of a slogan, like a Thich Nhat Hanh type of slogan. That, that is your slogan. Oh, what is it? Peace is every bite. Yes, peace is every bite. Yes, <laughs> it's true. Remember? Peace is yes. every step. Peace is every, his is peace is every step. Peace is every bite. Yeah, I mean, the fork really, is the most powerful thing to change the world if we all focused on really, that. You know, really the tremendous. fork and the actual fork. <laughs> yes, well, I'm so thrilled about it. It is totally, you know, in Tibetan medicine, I don't know if you, I don't know if you ever actually looked at its text at all. I know you, you, you know about Medicine Buddha, but uh, the first two, uh, the first two ways you diagnose a patient's condition are lifestyle and food and diet. Before you talk about anything else, yes. or, yeah, lifestyle and diet, those are the first two in, in, in analyzing causation. The second noble truth of a doctor, you know, yes. is, is, uh, is the causation. And so that's... Uh, that's um, lifestyle actually, and I, diet. actually um, I, I'll send you an article that I wrote called The Right oh, Medicine. Right, like oh, you know, good. it's like a, an additional oh, additional to the eightfold path. It's called the right medicine, oh, and I talk do. about Tibetan medicine, and oh, I talk right. about how this is exactly the framework we need. What is the right medicine for what we have now? Or the oh, right treatment so for the right cool. person in the right time, and the right medicine is uh, is for our chronic disease epidemic. Is not just more pills and surgery. It's actually fixing the system that's causing the disease. Of course, of course. And, you know, you never, even dear, brave Bernie and Elizabeth, they're going to fix the financing and insurance and the whole thing, but you never hear them saying cost of it has to do with this big monster elephant yes. in this room. Yes. Big ag and big food, you know. Yes. Just so brave. But now, so, so that's really wonderful. I'm so pleased. And what about how many, how many other fellow colleague doctors have you enlisted on this? I mean, are you the lone? Are you out? <laughs> I, I have not seen. I mean, are there other food fix style level books um, or no? Uh, no one. No, I just exactly. nothing like this has ever been written. I think uh, no one's connected I, I, all I the mean, dots. I think there are I some have never doctors. Never seen anything. No, there's a doctor it's, Zach Bush who uh, is connecting the dots between soil and health and agriculture and so forth. And there's a doctor Daphne Miller who also has written a book called Pharmacology about the soil and our health. Yes. So there are people who oh, are working on aspects of this, yes, yes. but not the whole spectrum of all the interconnectivity right. here. And I think that's what we have to do yes, so you have, understand. You're also activist. You've gone into the political thing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you, live, you live in Elizabeth Warren's state. I do. When she, when she lists the corruption, does she mention big ag and big food? I don't think so. I, I Not really. You know, it's, it's interesting. When you look at the amount of money uh, and the lobbyists, uh, you know, it's, it's staggering. I know. The, 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 you know. If you look at a, a graph, um, you know, agriculture and big food is here and everything else is down here in terms of the amount of dollars. It's, it just dwarfs the amount of money of every other industry, including fossil it, fuels. Really? Including yes. fossil including fuels? Including fossil fuels. It's, it's, it's double and or the, triple. So, so say... Fuels. So say if we are giving by sold out cheap, cheap trick politicians, uh, twenty billion dollars a year subsidy to the oil and gas industry, the fossil fuel people, coal. 
then then the through the farm bill and other things, the amount of subsidy to the big ag and big food must be much bigger through the SNAP. Have, well, did you, there have, is, did there you is. aggregate right. that? Did you aggregate that? <laughs> yes, have you, it's, an enor- it's billions uh, did I miss of dollars. That? Known as billions I know, of dollars. but how, how many billion? I, I'm really so, curious. So for, for the farm bill, uh, just yeah. for food stamps, it's yes. about $735 billion for okay. one bill. Okay, but yeah. out of that, Agri- to going to going to the diabetes. And, and out, well, out of the f- food stamp or SNAP program, seventy five percent of it is uh-huh. for junk food. Ten percent okay. is for soda, which is seven. So that's eighty five percent. Eighty five percent. Well, no, it's, so it's, it's total is seventy five percent includes that. The uh, okay. the the ten percent of soda is is seventy is is seven seven billion dollars a year or thirty billion servings a year to the poor. Uh, making Coca-Cola the m- number one welfare recipient in America. I know, but then, but all of them are getting then. Now this, this is this is the thing. So that means if it's seventy-five percent of seven hundred and sixty billion, that means it's about six hundred and some billion yes, subsidizing junk the uh, junk food system. Yes. yes. So that I- is like. That's like you know thirty times what the what the fossil fuel is getting. Yes. so that's a huge. It's a huge amount of money, and, and, then, the, think- and then there's agricultural subsidies that are about forty four billion uh, mm-hmm. over over a period of ten years. But the just the last year, because of, of the, the incredible harm that was done to uh, the midwestern farms, where we lost a million acres that were flooded in part because of the effects of climate change, President Trump had to fork up a $20 billion relief bill because of that and also the tariffs and the trade thing. Know, so that, that's, that, that's like literally five times the annual subsidy to the entire agriculture industry in one year uh, because of, of what was going on. Well, yeah, that's a subsidy direct, but the SNAP subsidy, if that's $700 billion, that's $600 billion they're subsidizing yes, subsidy yes, to junk yes, food. Because yes. they're immediately buying that junk food. Yes. Yeah, for the snack. And then, and and then the only, schools. And, the then this, and then there's and then there's uh twenty five billion dollars for school lunches. Yeah. Most of which is also pe- junk food. Pizza is a vegetable, yes. Yes, twenty five billion. Read that. Yeah. That's a, <laughs> it's an yeah. So, so you know, when you look we're at looking. it on an annual basis, just school lunches and yeah. snap is a hundred billion a year. Yeah, I I think even more. Even so, more because because they're buying that means they they have to buy that with the snap so it goes right back to the company but then this is the point i want to get to with this as i do with the fossil fuel and that i i didn't even get i i read the book but i didn't quite get that the normality of that you realize that those people what do they spend to lobby maybe four or five billion oh my god at least i mean just one okay, bill. okay one but maybe, just one just one bill the farm bill was Five hundred million dollars, uh, and that's a big bill. On a much smaller bill, which was de- euphemistically called the "Denying Americans the Right to Know" or the Dark right. Act, which was right. a GMO labeling law, right? Which was defeated in Congress, which is why we don't have you know transparency on GMO labels like most other countries, including Russia and China, which are not known for their <laughs> democratic principles. Um, <laughs> They they have GMO labeling. The, the food industry spent one hundred and ninety two million dollars in one year to fight this one bill. Right, but wait, but see, this is the point I want to make that I'd like to get to, that when in the activist side, they if they are making several hundred billion, let's just say three hundred billion dollars out of the subsidies in the farm bill and this bill and that bill and then the agricultural grow mm-hmm. this crop and that bill and all of that several mm-hmm. hundred billion mm-hmm. and if they spend 20 billion let's say for all their lobbying all their k street no, offices they, they make all the like salaries bandits. no that you know the, if i was a corrupt politician and i'm only getting two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for my campaign i'm like what? I'm totally undercharging those bastards. Yes, yes. They well, should you know, be it's giving. Like, it's not so. It's not so transactional. I mean, I think that yes, they they do support the campaigns of these politicians, and they are in their offices talking to them and quote educating them. Right? They're yeah, they're yeah. educating them. But but what really has become clear to me is that there's nobody educating these lawmakers from the other side. And so I've had the opportunity to be in Washington and to meet with Republicans and Democrats and staffers 
and the level of awareness of this is so low Yes. And they're, they're, they're filled with all sorts of misinformation. So a typical lobby company, what they call advocacy group, from an industry will come into the White House or come into a senator or congressman's office, and they'll have a briefing book with 50 regulations they want modified, with legislation they want changed, and not just changed, they literally write the legislation oh, for know, them. They provide all the, quote, scientific backup to right. kind of enforce why they should do that. But right. they never hear the other side. So this right. is really why I, I really start on this path and, and, and trying to build a movement, both grassroots to create awareness, but also a movement within Washington to deal with the 2,000 right. people who make the decisions in the White House, the agencies, and Congress, right. and educate them. And, yes. and, and I think help them understand that they're not acting in their best interest ultimately, nor in the best interest of their constituents. Yes. Because, you know, like you said, I mean, the fact that no one, I mean, Tim Ryan talked about a little bit when he was running for president, but no one has talked about how Medicare for all will be a disaster unless we fix the reason why we're so overburdened with chronic disease. That's it, that's it. We, that's we it. absolutely should yes. have health more, as a more. human right. Yes. But, but yes. the fact that, that, that we aren't even talking about why people are using Medicare, why it's yes. so expensive, why people are sick, yes. is just, to me, criminal. We need to yes, face yes. the fact of why we're sick and yes. why our healthcare system is so crippled. And, and we're, we're seeing that now with COVID-19. We, we already had a healthcare system overwhelmed by chronic disease. And now it, could not, it cannot take on the extra burden of dealing with this viral illness. And if we unburden people from uh, these diseases, which are almost entirely preventable and often very curable through food, we literally could dramatically reduce our healthcare expenditures as a nation. We could improve the quality of health, improve people's happiness, and, and not, not actually need to bankrupt the nation to pay for healthcare. Yes, 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 exactly. Well, that is really important. They're really important, you know. So how, well, how about the AMA. Well, I think I think there's an increase. Where are they on that? I think there's an increasing awareness that, you know, that that this is an issue. Uh, you know, at Cleveland Clinic, we have a food as medicine program there. There are many you know, institutes like Tulane that have culinary medicine. There, there's there's a starting awareness of how important this is. But the truth is that many of the professional associations are funded by the food industry and yeah. the ag industry. So, so, you know, one of the reasons we're in this mess is, is not just because of lobbying. There, there's, a, there's a very concerted and I think deliberate strategy by food and ag to do a number of things. One, to you know, massively advocate and lobby in Congress. We just covered that. Right. To, to co-opt science. And the way yes. they do this is they spend... 12 times what the government spends on nutrition, quote, nutrition research, producing studies that are so ridiculous, like yes. candy is a great way for kids to lose weight, or that soda <laughs> plays no role in obesity. <laughs> and so they pollute the science, they confuse yes. consumers, they create doubt, which is exactly what yes. the tobacco industry did. Yes, exactly, and, and the oil industry, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they lobby, they corrupt science, then they infiltrate public health groups and professional associations like the American Heart Association, the Academy right. of Nutrition Dietetics, the uh, American Diabetes Association, right. and they fund right. those groups with millions and millions of dollars. And, and so they're, yes. they're conflicted. And then they, they, they fund even public health groups like, like Feeding America, uh, which is a hunger group where most of the people on the board and most of the funding comes from the food industry, which is why those groups oppose any modification of the SNAPper food program to improve nutrition quality, uh, which, is, yeah, yeah. Which, yes. is, which is so unfortunate because we can implement nutrition guidelines as part of yes. food stamps. We do that with food, school lunches. We do that with the women and children feeding program, but they, they oppose that. And then, and then they infiltrate the the social advocacy groups like the Hispanic Federation, the NAACP, and fund them with millions of dollars <laughs> that, that actually make them allies and f allow them to oppose things like soda taxes. So the very right. populations, 
the minorities who are more genetically susceptible and are more targeted by the food industry, they're opposing things that will help them because of yes, the funding. Yes. So, so you've so got that. And then you've got lobbying, you've got nutrition co-opting, you've got professional size co-opt, you've got social advocacy groups co-opted, and then they create front groups. So just four, four companies spent half a billion dollars over four years on front groups to confuse the public. For example, a group called Climate Smart Agriculture. Now, uh, Bob, you would probably join that group because it sounds so great. But actually, it's a, it's a ruse for fertilizer companies to promote the increased oh, use no. of fertilizer through what they call sustainable intensification. So they hijack the language or they create the American Council on Science and Health, which purports that uh, GMO, smoking, pesticides, trans fat, high fructose corn syrup are all fine for us. And they are funded by Monsanto and Pepsi and Coca-Cola and Big Ag. That group alone spent $30 million to defeat the labeling law for GMO in California. Yeah. Yes. And they yes, won. Yes, so yes, so yes. This, is, this is the kind of stuff that's going on across all these sectors that leads to such confusion and doubt when there really is no doubt about this. No, there is no doubt about it. So, so listen, so then what about this? Let me, let me ask you this. What about... How could it be, I mean, this is all due to money, right? They make money. They, they, they think they make more money this way. But how, how about, how could it be that they could make more money another way? Yeah. You know, like I, I meet sometimes in Europe with the Norwegian group where they bring oil people together. Because Shell and BP have a little tiny trickle of half greenwashing, half enlightenment. And I, I always tell them, I always tell them, why aren't you guys looking at the data and then deciding to, well, you have big capital, put the capital into renewables now and be the kings of the ongoing energy industry. Yeah. Why are you insisting on spending $100 billion every year finding more oil that you can never burn? Yeah. Why? Yeah. What is the reason you're stuck in this treadmill of self-destruction? When you could, you know, you like being wealthy, you like making money, you could make more money longer term mm -hmm. without end on mm -hmm. harnessing the sun and the wind and yeah. the earth and the ocean. Yeah. And uh, they go, well, you're right, Bob, but that's all we know how to do. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. You know, I, I, I actually had uh, a chance to meet with uh, somebody who ran the Sovereign Wealth Fund for Abu Dhabi, one of the wealthiest uh -huh. nations in yes. the world. Yes. And he said, they have, you know, 100, 200 years of oil left. Um, he said, but they're actually investing heavily in renewables and they use solar to run their desalination plants in Abu Dhabi. And I asked him why, and he said, it's much cheaper for us than yeah. the oil. So yeah, I, I, I think this is gonna happen. And I think, I think you know, people are stuck in a certain paradigm. People have certain business models, you know, and if you make eight track tapes, you know, you went out of business. If you made horse and buggies, you went out of business unless you adapted. And I think yes. there are companies that are adapting and understanding the benefit and the economics yes. of this uh, yes. and, and, and the benefit to them. The problem is the economic system is set up to socialize costs and privatize profits. So meaning the yes. consumer, the taxpayer, the government yes, yes. paying the bill to have um, them to suicide, committing to pay for their own right. suicide. So right now, you know, for example, if, if we created a method for paying for carbon sequestration, carbon capture. Um, yes, regenerative agriculture, yes. Yeah, regenerative agriculture. Um, we would actually incentivize a different form of agriculture. And there are companies now that are doing that. So, for, oh, example, for example, Danone and General Mills um, are, have a big regenerative agriculture programs, and they believe oh, that it's in their best interest to protect their supply chain because they understand that the way we're growing food now with our industrial agricultural methods, it's threatening our ability to grow food in the future I know, because it's going to be destroying the soil that we need to grow the food. So they dust get bowl, that. Dust Bowl by 2030. That's dust right. Bowl. Dust I mean, we, bowl. We, we are projected Down to Steinbeck. run out of soil within 60 harvests, according to the UN. 
That means no soil, no humans. I mean, forget yeah, about climate yeah. change. That's the biggest exactly. crisis. Exactly. And, exactly. and so, and so when and we they're, look- And they're selling this Monsanto, they're bribing governors in India to turn the Indian farmers into this. And the Indian farmers are committing suicide. When That's they, right. Well, even in America, suicide is on the rise. Bankruptcies are on the rise. The average yes. farmer loses money. So, so what they're finding now is that, that actually uh, it's in their best interest and they're funding farmers. These big food companies are funding oh, farmers good. to learn how to do regenerative agriculture and to convert their farms because it takes about yes. three years to convert over and get the economics right. But then those farms make far more money than the regular conventional farms. So yes. this is going to be an economic argument. And, and they, the, produce, uh, they produce more food per acre than that stupid right. mono, monoculture. That's right. Gabe Brown is a, is a regenerative farmer I talk about in my book, Food Fix, who yes. was a traditional North Dakota farmer, had 5,000 acres, and was yes, growing yes. industrial food. And yes. his farm was devastated by hail and weather and so forth. And he, had, he was about to go bankrupt, and he decided to try something different and has actually created a regenerative farm where he produces more food, better quality food, in a regenerative way soil. that uses less less resources, less yes. water, no yes. chemical inputs, no fertilizer, yes, and makes twenty times the amount of money as his neighbor, all while actually increasing the soil. He's built twenty nine inches of soil, which holds an, per one percent organic matter can hold twenty seven thousand gallons of water, which makes him drought and flood resistant. That's so fast. And, and he's increased yeah. the biodiversity in his yeah. farm. Yeah. And, and it's, it's all a win, 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 win for everybody. And it's a doable yeah. thing. So I think the economics are going to be driving this. I think these companies are starting to think about this. I think, you know, consumers are driving change in the marketplace. So yes. while we may feel powerless, our choices matter. Burger King oh, of course, just of released course. an ad that was sort of goofy, but it showed a big whopper going moldy in time-lapse photography over 34 days. And the caption was, was <laughs> at the end of the commercial, was the beauty of no artificial preservatives. And so that's not to say a Big Whopper is healthy, but uh, it's showing that the food companies are responding to the market. Uh, Kellogg's decided they were going to announce to get, they were going to have glyphosate out of their cereals by 2025. Glyphosate is a weed killer. It's incredibly wait, wait, toxic to harm, the, harmful to humans. What, what, what's with the 2025? What is that? Well, they decided what, they're going to... What's wrong with 2021? I, well, I agree, but it takes, what? I guess, what? to change over the farms. I mean, they got to change over all the agriculture. So uh, right now, there's more, there's more glyphosate or weed killer in your Cheerios than there is vitamin D and vitamin B12, which are <laughs> added to the cereal oh, no. as when fortification. Little, so if... You, was, if you put it on the oh, label, it would be more in the ingredient list. Oh, oh no. Ah. When I was little, although I think it not at that time, I would only eat Cheerios. Oh, no. I wouldn't, I wouldn't eat Rice Krispies. Well, I wouldn't eat Corn Flakes. Back then, but they didn't know, put glyphosate on it, so you're fine. I know. I know. And you know why? I found out, Vincent, when I was, uh, when I was in, with the Tibetan monk, Tibetans eat zamba, roasted barley zamba, flour. Zamba, yes. It tastes exactly like all those old Cheerios tasted. Oh. And I wouldn't eat any other cereal. It, to me, it's a big proof of few form of life. Yeah. <laughs> my mother and father were really freaked out. I would not touch my brother. So you were a were... Tibetan monk in your last life, and all you ate was roasted barley for breakfast. That's right. Oh, I, I have see, to tell you. Have you, you ever had Zampa? Have you ever had Zampa? I with, have uh, Zampa. Yeah, actually, I, I have to tell you a quick with, story. Uh, with, with butter tea, with salty butter tea, yes. you moisten it with that. So it's a little warm and it has yes. a little salt. And yes. I, it's so and it has it has a uh, dree cheese, which is a uh, female yak. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And it's right, right, right. so I actually cheese. was was with the abbot of Menry, who's the thirty third yeah. abbot of the Bun yeah. tradition. Uh, yeah. A few years ago, before he died, and and he, he you know he really was was diabetic was was not super healthy. I um, know. And, and when, I, for, they, because they eat junk food as refugees when they first come well, out. Well, he, it he takes he them time to learn it. He didn't, no, no, but, that's what they, they were given that. As, yes, as, of course. Uh, so, so he, we were sitting, he made me eat every meal with him and I was sitting with him and, uh, yeah, that's and he, awesome. was eat, he was eating Sampa and I said, this is not good for you uh, because it's just <laughs> grain and you, you're, you're diabetic. He's like, no, 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 this is our traditional food. I said, yeah, maybe if you were herding yaks at 17,000 feet, you could that's eat right. this, but you're sitting on a meditation cushion all day and it's not the best thing. He's like, no, 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 it's fine. I said, okay, let's do an experiment. Let's check your blood sugar after you eat it. 
and let's check mine and let's check uh, the other monk who was healthy. All right, and, all right. And uh, you did that? And we did that. And he, uh, his blood sugar went through the roof. And he was like, oh my. And he saw that you know, this was a problem. And then he, he was willing to change his diet. And we, we got his diet changed. We had got him almost <laughs> 35 pounds. Oh, that's awesome. And he got awesome. really healthy. And it was really awesome. He was just my best patient ever. Well, you know, he and I made a special pact uh, agreement. Because, you know, Bern is Buddhism. Yes. Outside of Tibet, universally. There's nobody questions it, and they basically teach Buddhism. Mm -hmm. But they just have a different Buddha. Yeah. Who lived in Iran like 40,000 years ago, and there's no, no record, no, there's no text, you know. The texts are all from the Indian guy. So in Tibet, they didn't accept the Indian guy from some political reason of 2000, almost 1800 years ago. And then the, the Buddhists in Tibet consider them different, right? So, so the Dalai Lama treats them as Buddhists in the exile. But we, had to, we, had a, we met in an airplane right next to each other after having known each other 20 years before in, when I was a monk. I mean, just and randomly met, met each other. Random sitting right there, and he joined, sat down seat right next to me, and for and a, sh a, a shuttle flight from New York to Washington, Dulles, uh -huh. and and he uh, and we in that we said we have to cure this because you Buddhists have proudly yourselves you're happy to be Buddhists, but but not in Tibet. If you, when you go back, then you'll still be this Buddhist versus Ban Ban versus Buddhist, and I said uh, so. Let's do this. Let's make a deal. You accept the Shakyamuni, and they'll accept your Shenrab in Iran. And they'll say, well, we don't know what happened 40,000 years ago, so we can't say it wasn't there. And then the, you, you can say, well, we don't know. They, he made another emanation in India, so we accept that. And he, he shook on it, he stamped it, he was ready to go. And I told Dalai Lama about it. He said, yeah, that's right. I did that a long time ago, said Dalai Lama. <laughs> well, they but, were good you know, friends. But, but uh, yeah, but, uh, but the thing is that how to get it back into Tibet. Anyway, I'm sorry, but I like that guy. But it's the coming back to the, the, the food deserts. I, I'm sorry, I, I, I digress. I, no, no, it's I, good. It's a good story. But anyway, the uh, food deserts. Well, you know, the, the Tibet, the, mon the we, monks. Couldn't, couldn't we interest people like Walmart, Safeway, or any of those food, food uh, things that still exist that Walmart hasn't destroyed? Mm. and get them to realize that they can't really make the big boxes anymore. Malls are kind of done for, actually, for other reasons. And they could make a lot of money now instead of competing with uh, Jack in the Box and Pizza Hut and all this, and they yeah. could put, put vegetable stores with their massive, you know, well, you capital know, you know, that's in actually food true. deserts. Yes, well, you know, the well, younger generation of the Walton and Robson families. We yes, they do. They're, they're, they care about this. In fact, they are. They're upset about it because they feel nervous about it. I know. No, they're they're very focused on this. In fact, you know, Walmart is the biggest seller of organic produce. I know. And the Walton family and and Walmart are very focused on providing uh, more whole foods and and actually focusing on health. And we've been talking to them and working with them. And, and it's very so exciting. Why, why can't they make smaller stores in those areas? If there, well, there has to be money there if all those junk food businesses are opening there like mad. And they yeah. go in there for that money, then they can make money. Yeah. I mean, there, there are all kinds of business models that could work. And I think this is going to require innovation in business. It's going to require policy change. It's going to require consumer behavior change. And, you know, the book I write is in you called know, Food I Apocalypse. Like, it's called Food Fix. So it's about the solutions, not just I the know. problems. And I want to say that I like that. I myself, you're better than me because I'm too much on the fierce compassion side. And it's like I get very impatient with these things. Yeah. But I notice that you always look for well, there was a good intention in food stamps. Well, yeah. there was a good intention in this. Actually, I once gave a talk at a Pepsi conference. That was the last one I was invited to. Ah. Not, not for that reason. But I gave a talk, which I, you know, I got a good honorarium, so I went, you know. But I gave a talk uh, saying about how they started out, Coca-Cola did anyway, with uh, coca leaves 
you know, in the thing, which are a stimulant used in Bolivia and Peru, and they, you know, they don't refine that thing and snort it, like, uh, like movie stars, et cetera, but they just chew it, you know, and it helps them with the altitude, and it's a stimulant. And you know, the, so the old sodas were originally in a pharmacy. And, uh, you know, the guy in, in, in Atlanta who invented uh, Coca-Cola, that's what he was doing in, in a long time ago. A guy named Pemberton, because I know one of his descendants who has no residue of royalty. <laughs> but anyway, I, so I gave him a talk like that. I said, this business that you're doing of making people unhealthy is going to be discovered by people and you'll be in trouble. So why don't you move over back into health? And make things that like, you know, go back into being healthy, helping people. Yes. Well, while you trying. have the money. While you have the money. And, uh, and they didn't mind that too much. Although, although I was drowned out, me and another guy were drowned out by a guy from the American Enterprise Institute. Oh. Who started, who started telling them that, the, that the, uh, they were going to be longevity drugs that were coming up from the hot big pharma and they'd all be living to 150 and playing golf and eating whatever they want right exactly. no, that's not happening. and, and that's so not happening. They, they had been looking alert from my talk and another guy uh, and they'd all slump back in their chair like this <laughs> they went like no, that you know? no, but that's no. why they didn't invite me back they didn't invite me back because i told a coke joke in the evening oh no but I won't tell that here. I won't tell another time. You know, you know, it's it's actually, uh, you know, here's here's where my you know my belief in whether it's true or not. I, I don't believe there there is a lot of evil intent out there. I mean, there are bad so people, good. and there are serial killers, and there was Hitler and all yeah, that. Yeah, but but, no, but, but for no the most for, for the no most part, people. these these people want good things for them, for their families or communities. Yeah, they're locked yeah. in a business model that's antiquated, that's outdated, yes. and needs to be updated. Yes. And they are trying yes. to figure out how to yes. do this. And I, yeah. you know, I, I sort of was the anti food industry for a long time. And then I sort of began meeting and talking to the leaders in the industry, you know, presidents, CEOs, top executives, oh, and, and really having deeper conversations. And, and, and they're really curious and they're interested. Like the CEO of Nestle is very focused on this. You've got these big companies. Now you can say, well, oh. it's greenwashing and maybe it's true, but I, I do, I do right. believe, I do believe they're trying to actually innovate and trying to figure it out. It's just hard to move a super tanker and change the entire model for them because you know they you have to figure out how to survive. And I, and, I know. And I think I think you know that's a challenge. And I think that, but they are. I think they are thinking about it, and they do want to be part of the solution. Uh, they also are at the same time doing things to really obstruct the obstruct the whole process. But yeah, it's, it's like a, it's schizophrenic a little bit. <laughs> but, yeah, of course, of course. But, but I, know, think, the way, I think it'll the way, get there. The thing, I don't, we can't though accept the super tanker thing too much because the amount of metal in a super tank, if you put them in all kinds of small delivery boats, they could reasonably change course, you know. It's like the English did destroy the Spanish Armada, you know. They totally did. Yeah. They were small boats, you know. And uh, the Greeks destroyed the Persian triremes with their little boats. So in the long run, they're not, it's, it's, and that long run is getting shorter and shorter. And so, but, but what I just wanted to say was, I love it that you, you dig in your causation to find the good intention that may be there buried under the really nasty habit. That's right. You know, as, as my old Mongolian used to say, there are no bad people. There's just bad things that good people do. Yeah. And and you have to get in to find the good part in there, which everybody has, you know. Yeah. I mean there's because a Buddhist they, principle that I often think about called Upaya, which yes, yes. is uh, you know, translated. I don't yeah. I don't know what the right trans salvific means, which doesn't really make any no, sense no, to no, most people. But they translate as skillful means, which is wrong. Yeah. But me means is not wrong. It doesn't mean it means means or method, but you know what it really means is art. Yeah. It's sort of the when art they, of how to communicate with people to yeah. help them understand whether you're, if yeah. you're a Buddhist and you're teaching a child or a monk or, uh, you know, a, a factory worker or a yes. PhD, you're going to be speaking yes. differently to them about what you're talking about. Yeah. And I it's think an we have to learn how to have that art of communication so that, you know, I can yeah. and you can have conversations with people who disagree with us, who have different worldviews, yes. who have different philosophies, yes. Yes. and find the commonality in who we are and what we're experiencing. Yes. And I think, you know, this moment right now, you know, while it's really tough and there's a lot of people suffering from the challenges around this virus, this COVID-19 virus, 
it's also a unique moment where where all of a sudden we're in this common shared humanity uh yeah. and and we're all having the same human experience together yes. uh this threat yes. and yes. it's it's it, it, it's it's not respecting ideological boundaries religious beliefs yes. dietary yes. philosophies <laughs> nothing and so we're yes. we're we have this moment where like wow we're all human first yes, and and yes, people yes. say to me how can you talk to this one and how can you speak to you know this oh, republican no, or that democrat oh, or this oh, and no. i'm like listen we're all human first and i yes. have compassion for all Listen. humans, and and I and I think everybody is a human being and a human soul first, and then whatever their beliefs are is is the conditioning that they've had, their their experiences, That's right. whatever. That's right. It may be right, it may be wrong, but but I, I don't pay attention to that, and I and I try to actually right. figure out how do I reach that human being in there that who so who wants right. the goodness for humanity, who wants goodness yeah. for them and their families and their children and their children's children, and I think if we can appeal to that, I do I do think we will see. Yes, well, that's the thing, you know, like, you're, the reason you're able to do that, from a Buddhist point of view, the person who's able to do that is the person who's willing to be aware that they themselves have a negative side mm -hmm. in themselves. You know, yeah. we, we, you know, in other words, here you're teaching food fix, and you probably are craving, uh, you know, uh, chocolate eclair after dinner <laughs> well, well actually i almost I, broke down I'm, there tonight because i almost broke down the night because my wife you know we've been you know stuck here and i and i and somehow somebody was talking about chocolate chip cookies and i got in my head that <laughs> i wanted to make chocolate chip cookies exactly and, and i yes, just man. yeah and i just but wait uh, a minute you know. let me ask you this question <laughs> what about stevia what is the <laughs> biology of stevia Good question. Seriously, uh, the biology of artificial sweeteners is bad. No, 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 no. But not stevia that may be a little bit better. Um, I think there is some data that it may actually not cause some of the harmful effects of the the traditional artificial sweeteners. However, I would caution. Uh -uh. I would uh -uh. caution you because most of the stevia we're consuming is industrial stevia, and it's made. It's either Truvia or Purvia, and those sound like Wonderful names, I, I don't but like they're that. made. They're made by Coca Cola and Cargill and Pepsi. Oh no! So they're they're what they are are their industrialized versions of stevia, which are extracting the alkaloids, which taste a little bit bitter. So the alkaloids oh. are the things in plants which may have beneficial effects. So of we may course. be taking out the beneficial components and extracting oh. it. In a way, just like so that makes sense. corn is not bad. I invested. I invested in a small stevia company in British Guyana or one yeah. of those Guyana. Yeah, yeah. And it went bankrupt, and that's oh, no. why they were crushed by the big, 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 big ones. Yes, I mean, yes, that's why. Yeah. I guess. So, it's so I think I think a little bit is fine, but there's natural but, but when, whole when stevia. But when you, no, you but when you grow stevia. it, yeah, well, you can hold stevia, right? Yes. That supposedly is a one. If sugar is a carbon six and it's a carbon five, or vice yes. versa. Yes. Or it, I don't know which is which. But one is less insulin, uh, less insulin stimulation. Yeah. Is, but but again, you yes. know, if, if you really have a sweet tooth, it's going to stimulate the sweet receptors, and then it's going to make you want more and more and more. So it's actually, addictive. Yes. So uh, you but, know, I but think, it's but it's less diabetizing than, than yes, than I think so. Sugar. I think so. But again, it's just like if it's going to make you eat more, crave more, probably okay. eat oh, more oh, other right. foods. So I'd be, I'd be careful. Too yes, much of a good enjoy thing. it, but yeah. I, I, yeah, no, I don't. I don't do trivia. I I try to find whole stevia, but I was always thinking about chocolate with stevia instead of corn syrup. You know, I yeah, that, a little chocolate's okay. Dark chocolate, a little bit, it's fine. <laughs> So my granddaughter informed me that dark chocolate will not cut it. No, you need the milk no. chocolate. <laughs> oh yes, she let me know, well, Grandpa. No. But you know, here's the thing. No. In, in, just in terms of our kids, because you know, this is a large part of what I write about in the book is how our kids have been yeah. hijacked in their taste oh, buds it's and, it's and how terrible. harmed they are. You know, two out of ten kids are obese. Yes. Four out of ten kids are overweight. So many kids have oh, ADD and behavioral death. issues. It's it's, death. it's really tragic. It's but death. but uh, you know what what we've done in this country is is to is to corrupt our children very early on with these foods that makes them crave them. And when you go to countries like Japan, what do they eat for breakfast? They eat raw fish and seaweed. 
right? Kids, there's no special <laughs> kids foods or I lunchables know. or I kids know. menus. It's just I know. like if, if a little kid in Japan is eating raw fish and seaweed in this country, we're giving them junk, they're going to want junk. So I don't think it's, uh, uh, you know, an, an inherent property of children okay, to okay. want you're, crap. It's something we've stiff. taught them to do. Okay, you're stiffening my grandpa backbone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can make healthier treats that are treats that are not so bad, that are high fiber, high protein, good fats, less starch and sugar. I've got lots of them in my cookbook. <laughs> Food, what oh, the heck yeah. should I cook? Oh, that's so right. People oh, yes. are home. I have that book. If people are home and they're wondering what to cook and they're right. just trying to make good food, right. try it out. Food, what the heck should I cook? <laughs> that's totally great. So you mean Truvia might have aspartame in it, you mean? No, no, it doesn't, but it's it's Rebicide A. So it basically extracts the Yeah, they um, never just let the natural thing happen. No, right? it's all it's all a, a industrial byproduct of stevia, uh, which yeah, yeah, yeah. you know may have other uh, un, unintended consequences. Do, do you know the aspartame story? Do you know the story? I do. Donald Rumsfeld. <laughs> yes. <laughs> At the, the guy Carter, who brought us the, the Iraq War. Ray, Ray, uh, uh, Reagan, 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 of course, brought the F the, the lawyers of that company into the FDA. Mm -hmm. And Car Carter had banned it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you know that. That best. Yeah. You really, you really know. You've really been down the rabbit hole. That is really great. <laughs> That's really good. I know all so, about so, it. So, 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 how can I help? Well, how I can think, I help? I think you are helping. I mean, you are communicating. You're sharing about this. You're you're part of the uh, climate initiative uh, from Al Gore. You're you're spreading the word, and I think you know you're. <laughs> Your fierceness, your your sort of um, well, yeah, well, sword of wisdom is cutting well, through all this nonsense. A little bit. Well, I'm getting more moderate about it all. But the thing is that I feel, you know, it's like the thing about the green nukes. I do feel that the activists tend to think it's all going to happen when we go out in the street. You know, we're going we're gonna to protest and we're going to do this and they're all bad and they're terrible. No. And, uh, you know, I, I actually was su surprised. I went down to Occupy Wall Street and I gave a talk there to, and we got them to meditate on compassion for the people above in the buildings who were freaking out because they were there in the, in the, in the occupying that square, you know? Yeah. That they are just as troubled as the poor people. Yeah. You know, they're, they're starved in another way. You know, they have money but they can't eat the money, you know, and then they eat bad food and they get cancer and die young themselves and they overindulge, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, and they were liking it. They were doing their thing, you know, they, they liked it. And I loved the sign one of them had, they, they had a sign that they would go around showing to the police who were standing around yeah. and they would say, you guys are one layoff away from being on this side. <laughs> yes, I know. It's crazy. <laughs> said, so, 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 no, I'm saying like the, the, we have to go to the leadership as well to f get them to be on their better side is what I'm trying to say. We do. And I think that's the goal is to, and I, you know, I, I've sort of been interested to see how in Washington in my travels there, there's such an openness on both sides of the aisle to addressing this. You know, I met with Republican leaders, Democrat yes. leaders, uh, and, yes. and once they begin to understand this, um, with, there are a few bad apples. There, like, there may be. There for sure Ron, Ron, may be. Ron, Mitt Romney is a good guy. Yeah, there there may be, but you know, I think. And in other words, what I you know what I used to say, I I give a pretty since the Bush since Reagan, I've been getting annoying people, but but I like to say when some Republicans come up who who manage to sit through one of my Buddhist ethics talks, they they come up and they say, well, what about Republicans? And then I say. We need Republicans. I say those radical who want to take away all Social Security, destroy the New Deal, like take everything away from everybody and blah, 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 you know, right, Maine Rand, you know, this yeah. sort of thing. They're not real Republicans. They're some kind of radical sort of, you know, neo-corrupting, you know. Yeah. And they're trapped themselves in the machine of that because they, they, don't, they don't, you know, I, like I have a thing I like to say, Imagine you had 35 billion right now. Maybe you could have fun with the first half a billion yeah. for the rest of your life. 
But the other 34 and a half are like a burden. Yeah. You know, where is it invested? Are they cheating me? How many people am I hiring? Well, that's why are there's a giving people? pledge. There's something it's, called the giving pledge. And a lot I of these know, billionaires I know, are actually doing that. But they're wait, waiting until they die. No, no, no. They're giving, it, they're giving it during their lifetime. People like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. There's a whole group. It's called the giving pledge. No, no and, I know. But I thought they're waiting until they die. Dude. No, I don't think so. Half, really. half of what's left. I don't know exactly Maybe how they, it works, but I think well, they are. No, no, I know they give small amounts. They have foundations and they give out 5% in a foundation. You have to give out 5% a year. Uh, I know they do that. But the big thing of giving half of my billions, I believe, is when you die. Hmm. And what I want to say is when they die, they're going to be climate refugees. Their children will be diabetic. They'll be completely in a mess. So why don't they peel off a couple billion and give them to food fix Association. Please, yes. Not, the Food not, Fix not campaign, yes. And, 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 and Gore, I told Al Gore, why don't you ask for a billion and train everybody, not just yes. 30, 40,000 yes, people? Yes, absolutely. absolutely. And he said, oh, that's great. Yeah, good idea. He says, and they also that's a good idea. You got to think then, big. And then the, the staff people, I urged them, I begged them, I said, please go to the MacArthur Foundation in the cycle of the $100 million grant and apply for that for Climate Reality Project and Food Fix, apply for that, Yes, please. yes. Well, we the are runners, working with the Rockefeller Foundation, other groups, and, and you know, the, we are in, in raising money now to drive this campaign, which will drive policy to fix the system. And, yes. and you know, we have a website, foodfix.org, uh, where you can learn more about it. And um, yes. we, al we also have and, a Food Fix. If you, but um, if you had a few billion, if your association did. Unbelievable. No, no, here, no, here's what I'm saying. You can outbid the lobbyists. Yes, yes, we can. We can create a massive education awareness you can, campaign. You can, can support act. the American Medical Association. Absolutely, we're working you can on support getting support the billions. scientists. You can give those departments and those greedy university development offices. You can give them special professorships and grants. Yes. To be honest, and yes. not to not to fund, not not to do the the crooked studies and so forth. Absolutely, I'm, I'm with the, you. If you know anybody who's got a billion and wants to pass I, I it do. along. I, I do, but you know, the problem is they have their own fellowship, you know, and if you're not one yourself, then you, one of them has to speak for their thing. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Well, I'm, I'm recruiting they, a bunch of them, so I'm, I will see. I'm, I'm, I'm working on that, and that's uh, my goal. Like I, ha I had one lined up to go to Mrs. Bezos who I think is burdened unnecessarily with an excessive divorce settlement, although it was good to get it away from Jeff. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then he says he's giving 10 to the climate. He just yes. said that. 10 billion. But yeah. then who's advising him? Yeah. Is he asking you no. for the food fix? Is he asking Al Gore? I haven't heard. I don't know. But, but why not? And I have no access. Yeah, but somebody who has one or two billion would have access. They could probably call up and yes. they would. Yeah, they well, I know people good. who know people who know people. So we'll yeah, see. Yeah, I do too. But I mean, the point is, they need to go to these people and give them the Greta Thunberg. Please give to these other people. They can do it, but they don't, and then they can. I think they maybe don't want to because they feel if they ask for a few billion from the Giving Pledge people, then they, those people would expect them to put in a few hundred million, and maybe they don't feel like that. But they can easily do that. Yes, it's true. It's just they, they, the people, the right information is not being communicated in a coherent way to help yes. them understand the path. And a loving way. They want. And, not, and there's no bad. Nothing is bad. A loving way. A loving but, way. But, yeah. but rigorous. No greenwashing. Yes. But then, or good greenwashing. Actually, if, if, if Walmart made... 500 small retail vegetable stores. Yeah, they could. They could. In the, in the inner cities of they the United could. States. That they would could. be a bigger, bigger thing than a $3 billion Medicaid for all. That would do more for the health of the people. I agree. Right? So powerful. And they would make money. Yeah, there are so many ways to make this happen. It just requires, you know, this this kind of critical mass of awareness and movement. And I think that's actually actually what it requires is a functional medicine man seeing the deeper causation and a more holistic vision, and realizing that there's more benefit and more profit in doing good. That's right. That's right. I think that at the end of the day, it's an economic argument. If you're, if you don't get motivated by the the need to save humanity, at least save 
our economy and our planet. Uh, I think yeah, that's a yeah. that's a good thing. That's a start. <laughs> that's a real good start. Like imagine, you know, I, I was at a benefit where a bunch of billionaires were there and they were going to help scholarships for underprivileged children. And they raised 14, 15 million in an evening. Wow. Some fairly not so good food. <laughs> and and it was, some of it wasn't bad, you know. And uh, 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 I kept thinking, I mean, I gave something myself, but I kept thinking, it's more amount, but I kept thinking, um, when these kids are graduate high school and the, these scholarships will kick in for them after they've done extremely well, they're going to be leaving Oakland and East Palo Alto, and they're going to be they're going to be moving to Nevada. Yeah, they're going to be their jobs are going to be waiting for them in Colorado, you know, mm. west east of the Rockies, the way it's going in California, that's according true. to the Al Gore thing. It's that 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 drought that's in Guatemala and Honduras now worst drought on the planet is moving right up the Pacific coast all the way to you to British Columbia. Yeah. Well, we saw it before. It's going to get worse. It's true. Uh, well, we got to work, yeah, work to do professor. 10%, 10% for 10 years and it'll be more calm. Well, that's what the beauty starting, of starting, starting, in, starting in 2021. Hmm. We can, uh, we, we can do it. I mean, it's we doable. Just, we just, we just did it for two months. Yeah, it's true. I mean, the, the UN said that if we took of, of using regenerative agriculture, which is a way to capture carbon in the soil, it's the most yes. efficient way to do it. Yes. If we took 2 million of the 5 million hectares of degraded yes. land around the world that's been destroyed yes. through industrial agriculture and yes. overgrazing, if we convert it to regenerative agriculture, we could stop climate change for 20 years. And it would only cost $300 billion, which sounds like a lot, but, no, no, that's but peanuts. it's it's peanuts. less it's less than the amount that Medicare spends just on diabetes every year, just just that, just Medicare and diabetes. I, I know so, because they're cutting off toes. Yeah, they cut them off. Toe it's pretty by screwed toe. up. We well, we pay for a toe amputation or a kidney dialysis, but we won't pay for a nutrition consult. <laughs> You go figure. Uh, I know, I know. Well, well, no, you are fig. You have figured. I listen. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't mean to intrude. No, no. It's your time here, and I and I'm so grateful. And I want to. I want to talk to more doctors. And I want to. I want. To, I want you to have uh, to increase this platform. That uh, you're doing this awesome job. Actually, I was going to ask you, the the thing you gave me with key messages, etc. Yes. I know that's, that's like a summary of the book. You know? Yes, yes. It's, people it's give like me the a, book, go to Food Fix, but we covered a lot of it. It's like an executive summary, but yes. I know one billionaire who I would like to send it to, who I also have sent the book already as an e-book. Oh, thank you. But I don't expect that person to say to read it, the whole book. Yes. Can I send this or is of this? Of course. Uh, no, you can send whatever you want. Oh, okay. okay. I'm going to also send it. Actually, can you send it to me? Oh, I have it electronically. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to send it in a, in a message because uh, I might read the summary, you know, uh, but, and then, then move on to the book or might have looked at some of the book. I can send you, I can send you also in a different summary that might help too. Oh yeah. That would I'll be I'll send good. you a few things to share. Yeah. I like to send to a few people. I, I, I really would because. They want to do, they do want to do things and they I are know. doing things. I know. People but want, you know they what? just don't know what to do. Here's really. the thing, you see, like I said about Buddhism in the other podcast, you know, and which I, we will say many times, you see, what Buddha did, you see, he didn't, yeah, okay, make a religion out of it, some people do. And then they say, then some of them use it to just frighten people more like the other religions tend to do to ingratitize themselves. You, know, you need us or you won't be survived. But he didn't say that. What he really said is, everyone can know what to do. Yeah. Really solidly. And they can really do it. And everyone knowing that is a huge thing to do. Yeah, we, we do have the power. We have the collective power. We have the ability 100%. When, when we really know, that if we really come to learn, uh, in 50 years, what I learned is there's no such thing as nothing. <laughs> no. <laughs> there's no nothing. Yeah. So therefore, I have to commit to everything. It's true. And I, 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 I restrain myself 
when I find myself not listening to my wife. Ah, you have to listen to the wife, always. <laughs> <laughs> because they're more aware of everything than we guys are. It's so true. They're less, less tunnel vision, you know. They tend it's to so be, they true. tend to be. Listen, Mark Hyman, I mean, have, have we, did we did the two the time now? Well, I don't know what time it is. Yeah, we're, we're good. I think this has been a really good conversation. I think I, it's, well, we've gotten... I, I, well, I, uh, it's not good because it isn't enough. It is enough. Because, There's more. Because, because you have, you really have done it, in my opinion. Because the, I you. do think, I really think, I talked to that oncologist. The, any oncologist who is not part of your food fix association <laughs> is really not doing their job. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, mean, I have to say. I mean, it. listen, we need we need and, all and, healthcare and, providers. And they and want to do it. They want to do it. I know that, but they're scared because they think this is the big problem. Everybody thinks it's impossible. I give a public talk somewhere in Mississippi, New York, wherever it is, and I say, okay, how many people here really think we're going to meet the challenge of this climate catastrophe? Real. At first, there's a bunch of few. Then I say, no, really think so. Really think we'll make the changes in time. I say, how many? Then just like two hands in mm -hmm. 800, 800 people. Mm -hmm. There are two stubborn hands really there. Maybe, maybe five. Yeah, we, we can. Well, I mean, I the have... beautiful thing about the food system is if we focus, because we, even if we get fossil fuels under control, which we can, um, yeah, it's definitely. not enough. We, we need to fix the food system which will continue to drive most of the climate change. And unless we fix it, we yeah. can't fix the bigger problem. So I'm, I'm ex excited that this is something that's doable and it creates yeah. a win-win-win for everybody. Win for the farmers, win yeah. for the consumers, oh, yeah. win oh, for governments, I, win for I, I, know. I know, listen, are you gonna make an inconvenient food? I've been trying. I've been trying to actually get a documentary going. We've been having conversations. I need to find the right person well, I know. to Listen, fund it. But uh, who, it's who, definitely who, on my list. Why, why don't you ask? I, I'm going to ask for you if you don't ask Al Gore who made the inconvenient truth. Oh, I, I know who made it. A friend of mine, Larry oh. David. Uh, well, why and, doesn't he make it for you? I, 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 I will. I will talk to her. I've talked to others. Oh, uh, if yes. you're embarrassed to talk, I'll talk no, no. to her. Oh, uh, I'm not, but you, you can for sure. Any, any help I can no, get, I'll no, take. No, no, I mean it. You have to, this, we can't wait. No, I agree. That, I think that, we need that movie, that movie done with love mm. for the food people even. Mm. Yeah, and, I agree. And, and, and let them come and say something. Yes. As a greenwash, send their greenwashers out to talk to you. Yes. And, and, and I mean it. And, and it's a very urgent. Because, you know, that's a big mode of teaching. You can give a hundred podcasts and lectures, but but one great academy, I'm like, this I book agree. should have a Pulitzer Prize, first of all. Oh, thank but you. But I don't award it, I'm sorry, I don't thank award you. it. So I don't know even, I, it's Columbia, but they won't listen to me. Religion oh. professor. No, at Columbia, religion professor? Ooh, yeah. What no, is that? No. So, so, you know, uh, uh, I wonder, do you know Jeffrey Sachs? Does he have your book? Uh, he should. I don't know, but he should, you know, but also the celebrities can be really helpful. I know your daughter, uh, you know, is, is very aware of these issues. And, she, uh, she is, know, she is, but she doesn't, in... she's been so focused on her kids and everything. She doesn't do uh, as many things of this kind as she could and would and should. Well, it's just but, co creating a collect, not just her, but creating a collective, you know, yes, awareness yes. through the celebrity angle yes. is, is the way our culture is. And I think that would be hugely you know, helpful. Do you know, do you know, David, if Laurie won't do it, uh, I, uh, one person I really know well and who will probably try to do what I say is David Russell, mm. who made Silver Linings Playbook and this and that. Oh, and wow. No, I don't know him. He, I know him really. He was a student of mine at Amherst. Oh, wow. In the 70s. Wow. And he's, he's a Maybe he knew boy. my sister. <laughs> <laughs> he probably did. He probably did. And... Uh, He's a really nice guy, and uh, he he wanted to make. I have a. I do. I wanted to make a documentary years ago about history, a sort yeah. of a Buddhist a Buddhist view of history, but uh, I, it, it didn't happen. When the when Carter administration was going to make it for me in the seventies, but the Reagan people didn't want to do it. Hmm. You know, global global history. You know, not just wasp history. Global sure. history. Sure. So so anyway, never mind. But I think that's a really so I can help. I'm I'm going to talk to people. And Thank I'm you. Gonna, well, that, I, I'm going to count you, you as part of the food fix campaign. That.
Oh, I want to be part of it. If there's anything I can sign up for, I will do that. Thank you. I really will. And, uh, and uh, you know, we, we do more podcasts in future. And, uh, and uh, really, it's a really great what you've done. And I really want an association of doctors to be calling, calling out the Monsantos and so forth as a corporate thing, not as individuals, corporate mm -hmm. thing, calling them out as a public health matter. Mm. Well, really thank you so pretty. much for having me on your podcast, Professor. Okay. It's been such All an honor. Day. And really uh, I'm so grateful you. You're, you see and the I, whole I, connection. Yes, and I look forward to you doing things with Menla, you know. But yes. You know, Menla, Menla means Medicine Buddha, you know that. Yes, I do. In Tibetan, you know, yes. it does mean Medicine Buddha. So, so more work you, together. We're on this are, path. <laughs> all right, all right. Great. This video was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. Menla Retreat and Dewa Spa Membership Community. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, please visit tibethouse.us. Tashi Delek, and thanks for tuning in.